Now is the second of our three sessions on archaeology. Um, and this session will take us to Myanmar and Malaysia and Vietnam. Uh, and we will have presentations, four presentations again for today. Uh, so I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, Scott McRae who is an uh, adjunct graduate and research faculty in the Department of Anthropology at Trent University and a co-director of the IROL at Bagan Research Project in Bagan at Myanmar. Uh, if you joined us uh, yesterday for uh, Dr. Giles' session on uh, Bagan, uh, on settlement archeology, span this is uh, sort of a sequel, but also a, a deeper dive into the archeological project at Bagan. And this is a video, video presentation that will take us uh, um, take us through 20 minutes. So without much further ado, let's start the video presentation. Located along the Irrawaddy River in Miramar's central dry zone is one of history's great Buddhist kingdoms, the ancient capital of Bagan. As this royal city rose to prominence, it was home to a large and diverse population that extended over 80 square kilometers and at the height of this empire controlled much of what is now the country of Myanmar. Knowledge of this capital during its height of reign is well documented through epigraphical and archaeological records. However, the pre brigan occupation has been elusive, dictated almost exclusively by references in quasi-mythical retrospective chronicles and restricted, restrictive stone inscriptions. To date, archaeological excavations have played a restricted role when it comes to either augmenting or challenging this traditional narrative. This is unfortunate because small-scale excavations within Bagan's peri-urban settlement zone and within the walled and moated royal city have demonstrated that considerable knowledge about the city's past can be gained through rigorous archaeological investigations. With the growing number of excavations, it's an appropriate time to analyze what we know about the time before Bagan, and assess this traditional narrative using information gleaned from contemporaneous excavations. The importance of archaeological data to our understanding of the era prior to the establishment of the Bagan regional polity reflects the fact that most of Myanmar's history has been conveyed to us through a series of retrospective chronicles. Such narratives extend into the distant past to the beginning of the current world cycle in Buddhist cosmology and era of the region's first kings. Given the deep time frame, they oftentimes incorporate fantastical events and colorful figures. Scholars from outside Myanmar have generally treated the chronicles as quasi-mythical, deeply allegorical accounts that suffer from the additional problem of being framed by the political circumstances of the period that they were compiled. These issues do not mean, however, that the chronicle should be ignored. As aptly noted by Bob Hudson, a cautious and analytical approach to chronicle sources, particularly if backed up by inscriptions and archaeological data, can add to existing information and at times research. For their part, epigraphers have offered alternative versions of Miramar's history and in doing so, they have chosen to incorporate certain aspects of the chronicles, namely those that are supported by inscriptions, whilst discarding elements that cannot be verified. These aspects, or those aspects of the epi epigraphic record that refer to began certainly provide additional set of historical events and characters that can be used to evaluate and enhance the information presented in the chronicles. The broader corpus of inscriptions suggests that the Baumar people moved into the area of Bagan in the mid-9th century. Um, written re references to Bagan began to appear at other centers around Miramar by the 11th century. These inscriptions appear to verify the existence of an expansionistic Bagan by the 11th century onwards. Most of the surviving inscriptions at Bagan itself date later in time to the 12th and 13th centuries. Assessments of the inscriptions also indicate that they were in a better agreement with sections of the chronicles that post date 1175, coinciding with the late Bagan phase. This is not surprising, it's at this time that Bagan's epigraphic record grew more extensive and historical dates also become more frequent and credible. 
From the standpoint of the current discussion, this means that the pre-Brigan and early Brigan phases and the times immediately preceding them remain largely outside the corpus of inscriptions, and the chronicles therefore lose one of the means through which they can be appraised and augmented. It's here where the independently generated data interpretations of archaeology might have the biggest bearing on our understanding of Brigan's development as both a community and eventually an expansionist polity. Interpretations based on the evaluation of written texts have long been overvalued compared to those generated through field archaeology, with the latter usually limited to complementing historical narratives in those parts of the world where these two lines of inquiry coincide. When disagreements between the two data sets occur, the historical documents usually reign supreme. Be that as it may, Gary Feynman cautions that archaeologists should not only avoid blind adherence to written word, but also refrain from cherry-picking important information from the historical record simply because it fits a favored interpretation. Thus, the goal is not simply to challenge the tyranny of te text, but to use it, the independence of the archaeological record to expose contradictions and tensions in the historical and archaeological data sets. There are three key topics that archaeological investigations can focus on when it comes to both assessing and augmenting the Chronicles narrative for the pre began phase. The retrospective Chronicles tell that Began was founded in 107 based on 19 pre-existing villages. The Chronicles also imply that Began itself may have been originally inhabited by Pew or coexisting Pew and Brahma people. The Chronicles also inform us that the capital moved several times in the 4th century, 6th century, and finally in the 9th century, which included the creation of the royal palace as well as the walled and moated royal city. At times, well, at this time, there are only a few instances where excavations that began have taken place, but in all cases, the results have some implication for what occurred in the area before it began. Reviewing these excavations provides a series of dates that speak directly to the aforementioned key themes. Addressing the wall and moated royal city of Old Begun, carbon samples were collected along the city wall when it was being reconstructed in the early 90s. The radiocarbon dates indicate an earliest construction date of the 11th to 13th century and continued occupation until the 15th to 17th century. Considered in unison, none of these dates support the 849 construction date for the city walls found in the Chronicles. The dates do, however, lend some support to a possible mid-11th century wall construction date, which corresponds with the epigraphical documented establishment of the Began polity. Moving inside the wall of the city, uh, excavations at the name Kazantitha Palace describe a series of superimposed platforms, brick walls uh, that form rooms and brick lined pits that probably served as post holes that would have supported a heavy roof. A retrospective assessment suggests at least three distinct construction phases. Particularly important to our discussion is the evidence that the palace timber structure was burned, which formed two ash beds separated by a lens of brick rubble. A set of charcoal samples were obtained from these exposed sections. Carbon recovered from the lower ash level provided a date range of 1320 to 1440, while the carbon from the upper ash layer dated to 1220 and 1300. As the dates from the upper were older than that from the lower ash layer, it is surprised that the inversion of dates might relate to older wooden superstructure elements collapsing in on younger, already burned wooden furnishings. A third sample of charred wood was obtained from the base of a large brick lined post hole, likely a fragment of a teak column. This sample yielded a relatively wide range of dates of 980 to 1250, placing it in the 11th to early 13th century. Thus, despite ongoing reassessment, expanding excavations, and the potential for yet unexposed earlier constructions, the current dates do not lend much credence to the chronicle narrative which proposed the 849 founding year for Began's royal city. However, the carbon samples taken for dating are likely associated with the middle of the three construction levels, implying that the lowest third level 
although remaining undated, must have been earlier than the 13th or 14th century time frame. Equally relevant is the fact that the excavations did not extend to bedrock, so we cannot be sure exactly how many different construction levels occurred below those exposed, nor do we know precisely when the construction was first initiated. Thus, it's important to acknowledge that we still know very little about the earliest occupation levels. Located 120 meters to the west are excavations of a substantially buried structure known as King Anamathrata Palace. Excavations expose several construction levels as well as a number of bricked line post holes. According to Hudson, levels 1 through 3 all post date the 14th century. Level 4 is believed to date from the 13th century or earlier. However, lack of 11th century occupation rules out any of the exposed building actually being part of this palace. The construction sequence also does not appear to support the city's founding date of 849 documented in the Chronicles. One caveat is required. The lowest level, level 4, was associated with the remains of two brick buildings and presumed to date sometime after the 11th century. We do not know the exact age. The base of the southern building rests on a natural soil layer directly above the water table. There was also a packed clay floor at the base of the second structure. As we'll discuss later, it's possible that this floor construction represented a rammed earth surface, meaning that it might potentially date as early as the pre-began phase. Certainly more research needs to be carried out, particularly in association with these earliest levels. The site of Jan Hult, referred to as the first palace site, is situated 14 kilometers east of the Began Royal City, a locale that the Chronicles suggest was established as the capital for the amalgamation of 19 villages in 107. Results describe an expansive surface scatter of earthenware sherds associated with high soil phosphate levels, potentially representing habitation debris. At the purported palace site, excavations exposed a large rectangular structure made from low-fired or sun-dried bricks. The building remains undated, although the bricks appear to be from the Bagan era, rather than the pre-Bagan or the Pew period. The team concluded that 107 date for the site appears to be entirely mythical. A set of excavations highly relevant to the pre bagan era have been carried out at the site of Utian Tong, located in Bagan's Peri Urban Settlement Zone, 2.2 kilometers southeast of the walled royal city. The site, referred to as Potter's Hill, exhibits two large mounds. Excavations unearthed the large and diverse quantity of artifacts that supported the interpretation of craft production activities which can be attributed to the 9th century and possibly even the 8th century. Two relevant radiocarbon dates indicate a potential pre began occupation with a date range of 760 to 980 and 880 to 1030. Hudson persists that the ceramic mounds were likely situated at the edge of a village from the 9th to 14th centuries with the earliest 9th century crafting occurring near individual houses and more intensified production being moved to the outskirts of the village, in particular the eastern mound starting in the 10th century. Independent confirmation of the U Tian Tong sequence comes from investigations at the same site carried by the Ira Began Research Project in 2019. Test excavations in the large flat areas situated between the two pottery mounds the area presumed to be the location of the actual village residences, exposed a series of occupation surfaces. The stratigraphic sequence demonstrates one significant shift in floor construction techniques and usage. This consisted of a transition away from well-constructed, comparatively clean rammed earth floors associated with domestic features such as post holes and earthen ovens, to the use of beaten earth floors which are little more than accretions of trampled ground surfaces. The, labor, the latter exhibits little evidence for associate domestic constructions. However, they are characterized by significant refuse accumulation as on-floor assemblages and incorporation as in-floor assemblages and comparatively continuous sediment deposition. The radiocarbon dates of the lowest of the beaten earth floors include 980 to 1031 and 891 to 993. These dates imply that the transition from the rammed earth 
to the beaten earth floors occurred sometime in the 9th to 10th century, solidly in the pre began phase. Logically, the series of rammed earth floors, which predate the beaten earth floors because of their lower stratigraphic position, must date even earlier. This suggests that the, an 8th to 9th century establishment date for the community is not out of the question. One final point concerning Utiantan is worth men mentioning. Ethnoarchaeological research carried out by Ira began research team demonstrated that the boundary between villages and their agricultural fields should be discernible in the archaeological record, with such transition zones not only being indicated by a lack of evidence for archaeological constructions, but also significant refuse deposits. The, archae the archaeology conducted at Uchen Tong so far suggests a similar ground plan to that of the traditional villages was likely in place in the pre began to early began phases. Changing our focus a little to architecture, uh, the style of architecture during the pre began period are typically derived from the pew type architecture. At Begun, except for a few stone, or stone-clad structures, most architectures built using bricks. Although the Pew are known for their stone constructions, they also built temples and stupas using brick constructions such as Sarah Christi. The earliest stupa at Began are two bulbous-shaped stupas. Temple structures during this period are similar to single-story Pew brick temples that are either a central core with four entrances and four Buddha images or a central space structure with one entrance and one Buddha image. One example of these is a single-story temple still in its unmodified pre began form which dates to 931 to 964 or before 1057. Although these temples were constructed with brick, their surfaces were covered with protective plaster, whitewashed with lime-based coating, and decorated with complex stucco designs throughout. While earlier researchers were uncertain as to the origin of Bagan's stucco work, recent discovery of Pad Da Mu indicate that pre began stucco work was a continuation of the Pew stucco work based on the discovery of an earlier encased Pew type temple inside a more recent 11th century construction. The earliest encased structure also seems to be decorated with glazed fitting. And although the provenience of this is find is somewhat poor, it could also indicate that Bagan's glaze technique may have its origins from the pew as well. Pew finger marked bricks, as well as stone covered with clay and stucco, were the construction materials and methods used for this encased structure. The combined combination of these lines of architectural evidence demonstrates that the pew were in Bagan before or coexisted with the Bamar people. Thus, while the architectural styles do not extend the occupation of began prior to the 849-850 founding date reported in the Chronicles, they do confirm the presence of the Pew culture group evident in both the historical narrative and the epigraphical references. So where does this leave us? Returning to our three key themes in the study of what came before Bagan, there are several observations that can be made. First, currently no archaeological or architectural da data support the 107 founding date for the amalgamated capital of the 19 villages. There is also no solid evidence for the founding of the walled and moated city in 849. However, growing architectural and artifactual evidence is beginning to identify Pew influence or even occupation during the pre begun period. Further, there is inconvertible proof that at least one village settlement existed at Utiantong in the pre began phase. Importantly, the rammed earth floors that were used in the earliest occupation levels at Utiantong may relate in technological terms to the packed clay associated with the lowest levels of King Anawathata palace excavations. This floor surface warrants more detailed excavation and chronological assessment. A similarity between floor construction at the two loci may imply the existence of a pre began occupation level inside the walls of the royal city. If this could be established, it might reaffirm the 849 founding date outlined in the Chronicles. That said, at Shui Creek, 
located near the Sulagan Temple Complex, the Irav Bagan Project also uncovered evidence for the continued use of rammed earth floors into the mid-11th century and possibly even later to the early 13th century. Thus, the level 4 packed earth floor at the palace could just as easily date to the 1044 inception of the regional kingdom, or potentially even later. As is usual, more research is required. Uh, through a review of both the historical narrative, the archaeological record, and architectural styles, there are clear strengths and weaknesses in each data set. Despite the growing corpus of archaeological data that address the pre began occupation, it is still very limited. However, through the support of the Department of Archaeology and local archaeological organizations, steps are being made to overcome these shortcomings. This places archaeological investigations at began and across Southeast Asia in a unique position to help better interpret historical sources, but also add to these wonderful narratives of the past that have been woven over the centuries. We have many people we always like to thank, and uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for uh, watching our preservation today. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and company, for that uh, interesting presentation on ground truthing the pre bagan phase of occupation. Um, we will get to questions and answers after all the presentations have been completed. Uh, just a reminder to all of you just joining in that you can leave your questions for our presenters in the Q&A box if you're on Zoom or in the comments if you're on Facebook. So please uh, leave a question uh, over there and every day we pick out two questions, uh, two people who've left questions for our giveaway get a special edition SPAFA 50 bag. Uh, on to our next speaker, which is of particular interest to myself because it is about rock art. Um, this uh, is uh, Ms. Uh, so Chao Ye from uh, USM, University of Science Malaysia uh, in of course, Malaysia. She is a PhD candidate at the Center for Global Archaeological Research at USM. She also uh, graduated with a postgrad diploma from SOAS recently, uh, and she's working extensively in uh, rock art in West Malaysia in Perak. And she'll be sharing with us some of her interesting discoveries uh, from the Kinta Valley in uh, West Malaysia in Perak. Uh, so, uh, so without much further ado, your, the floor is yours. Hi, Noel. Hi everyone, um, good afternoon from Malaysia. So I'll just um, share my slides. Okay, so um, can everyone see my slides and hear me clear? Yes, it's good. All right. So um, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, myself, I am a, a PhD candidate and I focus on rock art research in um, Kinta Valley, uh, Perak. So previously, um, uh, also I'll just go with the outline first. Um, the introduction and then I'll talk about the recent survey, um, which we discovered a lot of new rock art um, in Peninsula Malaysia. And then a very brief overview of the Kinta Valley rock art because there are too many sites and I can't really squeeze them all in these 20 minutes. And okay, so introduction for Kinta Valley um, is located in the center of Perak, uh, which is slightly southeast to Legong Valley, um, where Perak Man is located. And up until 2019, there are only three rock art sites reported, which is Guatambun. Um, Guatambun is one of the most famous rock art sites in Peninsula Malaysia because it was the only known um, surviving red painting site, uh, but not until this survey. And then we have Guatelawar and also Guamasurat. So a very brief introduction to these three sites. Um, Guatambun, um, there are mainly red paintings. There are also purple, orange, um, yellow, and some possible petroglyph. They are presumably to be Neolithic period, but 
there are also a lot of um, Hoabinian period stone tools discovered um, from excavations in 1960s. So Noel, he actually did his master thesis on Guatambun um, and then he documented 640 motifs. It is still the highest number of mot uh, motif recorded in Peninsular Malaysia. And then next we go to Guacalawar. They are mainly charcoal drawings. It was first reported by Taha and Jaafar in 1990. They did not did a um, complete documentation of the rock art motif. So I did a documentation in um, 2020 and there are approximately 320 motifs. So there are a lot of um, elephant motif or an, um, animal riders motif in Guacalawar. And then Gua Matsurat, there are only um, charcoal drawings. It was first reported by Juso in 2011. Um, the documentation um, in 2020 revealed about 60 motifs, but the problem with this site is that there are a lot of graffiti. So sometimes it's very hard to differentiate between graffiti and the rock art. So now I would like to introduce um, our collaborators. The first one, um, they are the biggest contributor for this discovery of the rock art in Kinta Valley, is Kinta Valley Watch. It's a community organization formed by a group of cave enthusiasts based in Kinta Valley. So we got in touch with them in October 2019, and they offered their assistance to be our guide and bringing us to the caves and rock shelters um, within Para. So um, we have formed some kind of collaboration where we provide them some um, consultation on archaeological potential or archaeological aspects. And they will um, help us to survey for the sites for um, rock art or um, any archaeological materials um, present at the site. Because um, initially they do have their caving activities almost every week. And now they're reporting to us um, new sites almost every week as well. And later on, we were joined by Bentrax Outdoor Recreation. These are actually a professional team specialized in extreme outdoor adventures across Perak. Um, they have their base in Gunung Lang Recreation Park. So they provide assistance um, where to reach rock art sites that is in very high um, elevation, for example, sites that we need um, rock climbing. And they also help to look after our safety when we go into caves and rock shelters. So the main um, point <laughs> of this um, presentation is about the rock art survey in October to June uh, 2021. So from the three rock art sites, we now have almost 33 sites uh, which contain rock art in peninsula, in within, just within Kinta Valley. In Peninsula Malaysia, there are more, but this is also just a conservative estimate based on the reports from Kinta Valley Watch. Um, until the time that I prepare for this presentation, there are 33 sites, but now I think there are more than 40 sites. So for this map, you can see they are, I labeled them with the name of the hill. For example, um, Gunung Kuang, um, number two means there are two locations within Gunung Kuang that has rock arts. So as you can see, the highest one will be Gunung Lano with six locations um, in the hill uh, with rock art present. And Gunung Panjang is where Gua Tambun is located. So overall, there are two sites with only colored rock art, meaning Gua Tambun. They do not have um, any black rock art. Colored rock art here I use to refer to rock art that are red, purple, yellow, or anything. Um, in most cases, there are only red paintings. And then there are seven sites with both colored and black rock art. And 24 sites, there are only black rock art with no colored rock art present. So for the overview, uh, this is the colored rock art percentage over the nine sites with colored rock art. So as you can see, Guatambun and Guamatsurat too, um, not the Guamatsurat that I mentioned earlier, but this is another cave at the same hill, but it's located in another um, in a higher elevation. So these two sites, they have 100% of colored rock art. There are no black rock art. And then for the remaining sites, for example, Gua Tempurung, Pro Rock Shelter, Gua Tosemala, um, Gua Kelawar, Gua Kupu Kupu, and Gua Selari, 
they all have both um, colored and black rock art, but we can see that the colored rock art still has a very low percentage. Even the highest at Guatemprong is only 32%, while the remaining are black rock art. Um, overview of the colored rock art is that they are mostly solid in field and they have handprints, um, which is not present for black rock art. They are usually larger in size, with the largest one at Guatemprong measuring approximately 130 cm in length. And the figurative motif have um, higher variability, meaning um, figurative motifs are like animal motifs, human figure motifs, and they, they are very different from each other, and no, none of them are the same. Unlike black rock art, which we will see later, um, they are usually more similar in terms of their designs. Um, for example, all human stick figures. But um, for the pictures here, you can see um, all these are the colored rock art, and a lot of them too are um, damaged by graffiti, um, which is a very difficult thing for us if we want to conduct dating and, and other analysis. So previously, Guatambun, as the only rock arts, um, red rock art site in Peninsular Malaysia, we could not do any comparative studies. But now we can compare them to a few other sites. For example, at Guatempurong, um, you can see the, the wild boar motif is very, very similar to each other. Um, from the tip of the nose, the uh, head shape, um, over number of C and D, they still have the small ears and from the tail, the bushy tail, and the legs. These are very, very similar. So I would suggest that these two sites, they have some sort of um, cultural connection in the past, although they are 30 kilometers away from each other. And another interesting thing is that for Guatempurong, there are handprints um, on top, uh, one at the nose of the wild boar and two other below the wild boar. Um, handprints is very rare in Peninsular Malaysia. As, um, the closest one that we can compare to are those from Thailand and maybe Laos, which might be related to hunting ritual. But for um, Malaysia, um, I'm really not sure because there are two little um, sites for comparison. And then another one is uh, Guam Surat 2. Um, it has a very interesting marine animal motif. Here you can see this um, fish, fish-like motif. It has a um, saw-like rostrum, which is very similar to a sawfish. Um, at present, Gua Guat Matsurat 2 is about one kilometer away from uh, Kinta River. So it is likely that the motif presented here are the river, mo uh, river fishes uh, present. And uh, at the lower right, there is a motif resembling a stingray. Okay, so um, these are all the rock art, uh, colored rock art that uh, I would like to share, but we have more black rock art. <laughs> um, so black rock art, they are more diverse in designs and they are usually represent, they are smaller in size. They have a lot of material culture or historical objects. And then there are two other um, motifs that I would like to bring to attention, which is crow variant and scientific variant. Okay, so um, at Gunung Kuro, uh, we have a lot of uh, human stick figure motif, um, which I said that um, there are less variability for the black rock art um, compared to colored rock art. But um, a few exceptions are those from Gunung Rapat Tree, Kuro Rock Shelter Tree, and Guatempurong, where they are very distinct in their style and they are not seen in any other place for now. Okay, and then zoom off. The most common zoom off for um, black rock art are elephants or elephant rider and fish. Um, at Guakalawar and Gunung Lang, you can see that there are animal riders riding on elephants with um, howdah. And this shows that these anim um, animals are domesticated, they are tamed. So according to historical records, elephants was once an important export of Para between 17th and 18th century. But the Mahal culture became obsolete in mid 20th century. So from here, we can roughly place the period of these rock art to 17th to 
uh, between 17th to 20th century. Um, for fish, a very interesting one is at Gunung Lang Wan. It's a rock shelter. And throughout the rock shelter, there are a lot of fishes, but most of them um, has barbels in front, which resembles a catfish uh, or ikan keli um, as, uh, in local name. And interestingly, from here, you can also see a watercraft which is in between uh, all these gigantic fishes. And then for material culture wise, there are a lot of, not, not a lot, there are houses, weapons, and something that resembles a Malay traditional kites. The house there usually um, resembles a traditional house of the Orang Asli, but this one is a, quite a unique one because it's a brick house. We can see the arrangement of the bricks. And then weapon, um, unlike the ones from Lengung Valley, the weapons in Kinta Valley are mostly um, swords or daggers and not firearms. So um, this is one of the scenes that I really like. <laughs> there are human figures and very uh, distinctive black rock art human figures. They are all stick figures. Um, they have weapons. They're, these weapons, they resemble a sword, I would say. And there are a lot of uh, four boats actually below. And all these um, motif, they have a dynamic posture as if the person is sleeping and they looks like they are engaged in a war scene. And with river, um, with watercraft motif located just below them, it may suggest a war scene documented near a river. And this side is only um, a few uh, meters away from Raya River. Uh, which is another important trading route in the past. And for transport, um, there are, the most common transport in Kinta Valley is um, watercraft. The motor car and plane motif are present, but very rare. Um, motor car and plane can safely place this motif to 20th century, whereas watercraft motif um, could be dated as early as 14th century to um, 19th century until the Quarrying activities somehow made the river um, not suitable for uh, marine activity. Okay, so um, now uh, I will take attention to a Kuro variant. This is a very special motif type that is widely distributed in areas to the north of Raya River. Um, from the map, you can see um, Gunung Kuro is on the red point, and the distribution is in the yellow um, oval shape. So it was named after the limestone massif, Gunung Kuro, where a high number of this distinctive motif was found. Um, it does not hold any meaning for the name Kuro variant. It's just a term for documentation. So from here, I um, categorized them into six distinct styles. And you can see they're present everywhere. Uh, over uh, Gua Kelawar, Kuro Rock Shelter, uh, Gua Selari, Gunung Kuang, and Gua Karang Besar. Their designs are very um, similar, and we do not know what do they mean for now, but it's something that worth uh, for further investigation. And the next one is the centipede variant, which is also a very distinctive style. They are always um, drawn with three lines in the middle and uh, small protruding lines at the side. Um, they are often depicted together with the curl variant, but um, we also do not know what they really means. We can only say that there is a carving of a very similar design on a Mahmeri blowpipe um, that they say that it is a centipede uh, motif. So in conclusion, uh, rock art of Kinta Valley is extremely diverse. So all the pictures here are the rock art of Kinta Valley, which I can't really put in the slides. Um, Rock painting traditions have been presented in this region for thousands of years since the Neolithic or maybe even Hoabinian period until the historical period in 20th century. Although no chronometric dating scheme has been undertaken, it is evident that the majority of the colored rock art is of deeper antiquity compared to the black rock art. So the colored rock art are possibly prehistoric and the black rock art is possibly around 17th to 20th century. It could be earlier, uh, this is just a very conservative estimate. But then there's a 3,000 years time gap between the colored rock art and the black rock art. So what happened between the transition? Like how do we, they change from colored to black? Are they drawn by the same cultural groups? 
Um, so far, we have no answers yet. But Kinta Valley is the only region in Peninsular Malaysia where both colored rock art exist together. So further investigation into the rock art of this region will be extremely fundamental in extending our understanding of the rock art traditions in Malaysia. So these are some of the reference that used. And then we would like to express our deepest gratitude to Kinta Valley Watch, in particularly Mr. Chim Buntat, who is our main informant, and providing us a lot of photographs. Um, also, Ventrax Outdoor Recreation for assisting us, and the members of Center for Global Archaeological Research, University of Science Malaysia. So thank you very much for attention. Um, if there are any questions, please put in the Q&A, and we'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Saul, for that very interesting presentation. I, I will have lots of questions for you later, <laughs> um, I'm sure. Um, but before we get to them, I will go on to our next few presentations, which are also equally interesting. Um, our next presentation, we go back to Myanmar uh, from, a, from a, a, a royal capital site of Hamsawati, which I'm sure many of you don't know. Uh, so I'm very interested to, to uh, see from this. This, present, uh, this presentation is by uh, Mr. Tozin Nett, uh, who is presenting via a video recording, uh, but he is also uh, will be available uh, live for the question and answer later. So without much further ado, this presentation is slightly longer, 25 minutes, uh, but we will uh, get through that and then get through our last presentation. I hope you have a good day. I, uh, let me introduce me first. Uh, I'm Dozen Lat. Uh, I will deliver the keynote on the new archaeological discoveries in the capitals of Pansavati. Uh, I am delighted to have a chance to present at this conference, this Firstly, let me show the timeline of the Hamsabati in 60th century. Uh, in 1510 CE, uh, Minjinyu established the city of Kitumiti. And in 1551, the, the king Bijinau succeeded his throne. And in 1552, uh, Bijinau succeeded the old of the Hmong people. In 1566, uh, due to the uh, some advice from the minister, uh, the, the Kim Vietnam status established the new Hanseverty city. And in 1568, the, the Kambosa Tadi Palace is established at a finished date. Um, in 1581, is the dad of Bayino and uh, the, his son and the being succeed his throne. And in 1591, Nandabian renovated the, uh, the city gates of Pansavati uh, to, to, to be the same with the same capital. Um, according to the historical records, um, in 1599 to 1600, the Hansavati city got destroyed. Um, this all information is uh, based on the, the Great Chronicle of Ugla. According to the chronicle, uh, chronological records of Myanmar, uh, the components of Hansavati capitals are as below. Um, the first is Hansavdi Rajasthani capital, uh, which means the great lands of the care and the city of Hansa. Um, and the second one is the, the war of Shimoda Baguda, the Maharan war. Uh, the third one is Pitical Library. It is measured till now and it, any evidence of this uh, can be found in the in the meantime. And the fourth component is the four corner pagoda. Uh, the Kim Piyinam uh, built uh, 
the four corner pagoda in each corner of the city, and um, three of them are reconstructed, uh, reconstructed by the in the modern period, and the one in the northwestern corner of the city remain as ruin. The third component is put images. Uh, the chronology said the chronological record said that the, the king built the four Buddha images in the east of the palace um, to commemorate uh, the Buddhas of the past, namely Thakudan, Gonagong, and Gadaba and Gautama. Uh, the, the last uh, but and not least components of the city is Kambosa Dadi Palace. Uh, it was a very famous uh, during uh, in the accounts of international voyager as uh, the the palace was built by the gold plate and the gold um, antique wool post. Here is the location of the gold and Hanservity in the map of Myanmar. Uh, the city is located. Um, just only 15 miles north east of the Yangon city. And according to the his uh, its way out, its way mm -hmm. out, easy way out to the to the sea, it it was very popular uh, between the international merchants during the uh, 60th century of as golden times. And the city was a rectangular, uh, rectangular in structures, and the the palace in in the centers of the city, and the Shimoda pagoda is also in, also within the boundaries of the city. And moreover, the king um, named the the twenty gates of the city uh, as the name of the town and region and uh, its range is named uh, the, the, the name of the cities and regions are Tanindai, Ayutthaya, Moduma, Bakan, Batay, Ye, Inwa, Tangu, Lanshan, Dalat, Chiang Mai, Ongbao, Munyim, Mogang, Dawe, Kale, Mune, Yangshui and Taiwanese and the last as Baini. Uh, it is the locations of the towns and region um, which is which was mentioned in the name of the cave of Han Dawdi. It can show the, the boundaries of the Burmese Empire uh, during the range of the Bina. Or it presumably thought that uh, Bina named his gate to show his power upon the city and region mansion. Starting from 2018, Department of Archaeology and National Museum in Myanmar started excavating uh, and survey. And uh, there are an odd three types of structures. Namely, the uh, normal turret, um, the, the second one is the uh, corner turret, and some city gate. And visual one uh, excavated in 2018 to 2019 is the normal turret destroyed by the, the rubbish can, um, former rubbish can in this place. And it, it was excavated in 50% presence. And the second one is video two, uh, excavated in 2019. It was a complete toilet and in the northwestern corner of the city. And video three is the Chiang Mai gate, and it was destroyed uh, a half by the, the expansions of the road. And video four is excavated in 2019, 2020. And it's an, an odd two complete turret and when complete city gate, um, which presumably top of uh, Spain gate. 
Uh, let me show about the normal turret, uh, which are 40.8 meter wide from north to south and 7.54 centimeter from east to west. And they are built, they were built uh, 55 to 75 meter apart. Um, and they are quite near, uh, unlike the, the Mendeley city. Yeah, you can see that um, the, 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 the half of the towers was destroyed by, um, by the former rubbish can at this place. And the, the below one is the, the, the complete turret is created within the visual fort. And it, uh, they will use at watchtower uh, or sentinel. And what might have been roofed by a building or a pavilion upon them. Uh, to know about uh, the construction techniques of those towers and city wall, um, the tax bill were operated during 2019-2020 video for excavation. And it was found out that uh, the both of the city wall and turret were built upon the reinforcements of Latra Brock. Here you can see. And uh, the big Brick side of 40, 40 centimeter, 80 centimeter, and 8 centimeter. And, and upon this, there are small brick size of 30 centimeter and 50 centimeter and 6 centimeter. Additionally, it was filled, it was filled by the art um, both both from the inner and outer sides of the city wall and the turret. And uh, the turrets were excavated at a height of uh, 4.49 meter. Um, however, in, according to the historical record, it was 0.75 meter. Uh, so it can be assumed that um, uh, almost uh, two, two to three meters of the structures has been collapsed. And it was show, uh, it, it can be thought that uh, 1.77 meter of the structures of the city were embedded in the in the art to to, to make foundations. Mm, the, 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 the evidence found out is the wooden bar in the below of the city wall. It can reasonably think of that uh, it was for the alignment, alignment of the city wall or the foundations of the scaffolding during building the city. It was the test bit operated um, in the back, back of the city, city wall. It can be prove, it can prove the, the supporting fillet out of the city. This is the demonstrations of the scatural layers of the city wall and turret. The light yellow and the the, the dark yellow are the debris layer and the red one is surface layer. And you can see from four, four seventy three centimeter, the original layers of the structures as uh, the supporting art. And it can be shown that the the structure will be built upon the lateral reinforcement. Um, the scholar who is studying the, the rectangular city and with the moat 
they 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 said that that's why for the from the place of mold, uh, dig dug out and wells fill to support the structures. From the from the inner side, um, it was it can help the the soldiers and guard guard soldiers to uh to easily get on the city wall. And the 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 soil outside the city can can attack the the, the enemy to, to yeah can attack can attack to uh, the animal the enemy to slip and to have the soldier from city wall to attack easily. The second one is the corner turret of Rio 2. It is the in the northwestern corner of the city and, yeah. and near the, 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 the corner of the borders of the city. It might have been roofed by the pavilion. The third one is the Bijou Tree at Chimai Gate. It is located near the southeastern corner of the city. And it can be seen that uh, the it is the complete turret or or the or the west west wind of the gate. And the east winds of the gate were destroyed by the expansions of the Guru. Adventure Road. So, um, when only one turret, only half of the Chiang Mai Gate would end up, according to the expansions and destruction of the road. It is um, it is the BGO four, the tiny gates of the city. Its dimensions are 28.49 meters from north to south and 90.486 meters from east to west. It was so strange that we, because, um, although the city was destroyed and the um, urban encroachment, and uh, however, uh, the the this city gate was an art. Uh, excavated as a complete form. It is the side brand of the tiny gate. There you can see the entrance way and the two identically similar turret, the wing, and there are also identified structures um constructed along with the gate and the sick post hole were found during the excavation at this elevation of the the gate it was uh, the, the the views of the tiny gate or uh, along uh, together with the shimoda pagoda or uh, from the other sides of the mold You can see the 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 the, the boat, boat wind of the turret, the gate, and the entrance way to the city. Uh, the half of these turret were destroyed um, in late twentieth century when Bedil, the the government uh, residence of yeah. Yeah, these are the puzzle on the south wind or the tiny gate. The, the, the shapes are rectangular, mm, the round and the rectangular. And you um, and the when residues of the teak wood was also an art during the ash layer. And they are about 
2.5 to 3 meters apart, and the width are about 30 centimeter. And moreover, 21, 21 into 14 centimeter roof tile are also an art while excavating the city gate, uh, which support the ideas of the post hole and which support the ideas of the pavilion of the building uh, upon uh, which roof the city gate. Here is the side profiles of the standing gate. And you can see the main bridge structure on the or the, the towers of the gate. And you can see block bread break um in the in the entranceways of to the city. Let's discuss about something. Um, there are also um, some and and the go and identify structure as city gate. They they were mentioned in the uh, above. Um. They are as as they are rectangular uh, in shapes, and they are quite small. Um, they can be assumed that they are dwelling or the resident for the guarded soldiers of the gates. And the other, uh, the, the second fact is that the distance between the turret and the gate. Um, in Mandalay, the latest rectangular city in Myanmar, and the towers were built with uh, one, 119 meter apart. But in Hansavadi, the distance between turret is, uh, is only 55 to 75 meter. And the width of the entryway. Um, because uh, it was 3.41 meter wide in the narrowest pass. So it, it can be used to pull a cat to pass through each other. Yeah, the, oh, and this support the, 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 the ideas of the side gate and main gate. Um, of the city. And the fourth fact is that the broken at the entryway. Um, it was um, it was found out uh, by excavating the bit that it that the brick the brick the brick layers are broke to the Big layer of broke um, in the later periods, not on the the, the construction period. Uh, the the fifth fact is the height of the post hole from the rain road. Uh, they are nearly three meter high from the rain road upon the moat, and um, so they they cannot be think of that they are the tall posts. And and they they can they might have been used for the for the building of the for the building up which roof the city gate and the variation of brick site um uh, the the totally five site of brick are uh, found during excavating the city gate and it was found. It was also found out that um, the city gate were built at uh, the, the structures of city gate and the part of some part of the city gate were found out to build at different foundation levels. That that uh, that is showing that is showing the 
proof of the renovation across the period. In conclusion, M Soviet capital is built in the mid 60th century in 1566, and it was fully destroyed in a cycle to the uh, 18th century. And uh, however, it was still a, a, a world known city during colonial period be, before the British established Yangon city. And uh, the, there are verifications that to support the historic renovations of Nanda Um it, it can be proved by the, the it can be proved by the size of by the size of the brick varies and by the different foundation levels. Uh, moreover, um, the splendors of the city and it's uh, according to its way out to the sea. Uh, it was a well-known port in the accounts of international voyagers. Uh, in conclusions, the evidence, uh, the evidence, the excavated evidence of um, this hands of the towers and city gate uh, sh show a new light uh, to the architectural sophistication and variations of Burmese historic city and Burmese rectangular cities of 60th to 70th centuries. Thank you so much for your attention. Our questions are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tauzinla, for that presentation on the oil capital of Hamsawati. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, a spirited question and answer session uh, later. And so finally, for our last speaker for this session, before we go to the Q&A, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, Mr. Alex Jiang, or Do Chong Jiang, who is from the Institute of Imperial Citadel Studies, which is part of the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences in Hanoi. And he is here to talk to us about Chinese ceramics in uh, Champa. Alex, the floor is yours. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Do Chong Jiang from the Vietnam Academy of Social Science. And today I am presenting about the a preliminary survey of the Chinese ceramic in Champa archaeological sites. And due to the time limitation, I will just focus on one special, uh, one specific period. It's uh, the, 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 during the time period from the uh, 7th to the 10th century. Uh, so the Champa Kingdom was recognized as a, a typical maritime polity in the pre-modern Soviet area. And thanks to its strategic uh, location between the China and Soviet area and the Western area, the Champa coast became a frequent destination of foreign traders and merchant ships for centuries. And ceramics was among the essential commodities in trade between Champa and the international traders. And this presentation relies on the archaeological records and few survey uh, undertaken at the Champa site in central Vietnam during the last few years, provide an overview of the uh, distribution of the Chinese ceramics in central Vietnam from the 10th to the uh, from the 7th to the 10th century. And then I will discuss about the trade and the diplomatic uh, relation between Champa and China and also the implication to the state and the development in Champa uh, during this period. Uh, this map showing the location of Champa in central Vietnam in the, uh, in the red circle, and you could see that the, 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 the uh, geographical uh, position of the, of the ancient kingdom of Champa uh, in uh, present day central Vietnam, and it's, uh, uh, it's a very a crucial part in the, in the maritime sea road uh, uh, during the ancient period, in the pre-modern period. Uh, this map, adapted from the Anna Valley Australia, uh, showing the important historical and the archaeological sites uh, in Champa. Uh, and, 
And during uh, and due to the time limitations of my presentation, we focus mainly on the on a, a specific uh, geographical uh, region in central Vietnam, especially in the in the Quan in the Quan Nam region, uh, or the Da Nang or Da Nang Quan Nam and Quan Nam region. Um, Alex, I'm sorry. I think yes. your slides are not moving as well. The slide not moving? No. Uh, it's moving on my screen. It's, I, I think you might have been sharing the wrong screen. The wrong screen? Ah, there we go. Can you see now? Yes. Okay, so I will use, use this screen. Um, So my presentation will pay attention to the to the reason of the we call in Vietnam we call the Quang reason. It's in, uh, including the Da Nang City, the Quang Nam Province, and the Quang Nam Province. The first location I uh, I mentioned is about the Da Nang City, a very important uh, port city and the tourist destination in central Vietnam nowadays. Uh, and in the past, the Da Nang city was also uh, an important uh, port city. It's uh, in the north of the Hotan uh, Hot Ocean Power. Um, and during my survey in this in, in Da Nang city, I uh, I discovered uh, not 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 I discovered but uh, Vietnamese archaeologists uh, discover uh, previously. And I now I am checking with the information of the, the Chinese ceramic uh, at the at the site in Da Nang city. This is named the Nam Tosun site. Uh, it's very close, uh, very close to the Wu Hansen uh, area, and also very close to the coast. Uh, as you can see in the map here. Uh, so the Nam Tosun site is a residential or the occupational uh, site, and and uh, in my opinion, it's also a um, um, trading center. Uh, during the during the time periods, because we because uh, Vietnamese archaeologists after the excavation at this site, uh, they discover the Chinese uh, the Chinese way uh, pottery and also the Islamic pottery uh, dating back to the uh, eighth or ninth century, and. Uh, because uh, nowadays, because uh, the the urbanization process in Da Nang is uh, is uh, developing very rapidly, so uh, uh, we 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 have very limited chance to find uh, another uh, uh, or to enlarge the activation in this area. But uh, hopefully, in the future, we could uh, we could do more uh, survey uh, or the more activation in this area because we have the evidence of the. Uh, we we we, we uh, uh, like uh, we need uh, more evidence about uh, the presence of the Chinese uh, in this area, uh, in this region. Uh, the second site is uh, uh, the second site I mentioned in my presentation is the uh, Hoan uh, is the Hoan uh, port city uh, because uh, Hoan is uh, is just uh, in the south of Da Nang city and is a very important. Uh, a city, uh, a port city of the or not only for Champa, but uh, later on for the Viet people in the later uh, centuries. And uh, we did survey uh, in this area several times uh, uh, during the last few years, and we also uh, read the 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 the, record, the activation report from the previous uh, activation undertaken by Vietnamese and uh, Japanese archaeologists. A uh, few years ago, I I joined a survey with Professor Bifun and Jin uh, Wen. We we travel uh, along the the Tubon River and by boat, and we visit uh, many uh, many uh, historical sites where we where having the traces and the evidence of the presence of the ancient Champa culture, and and we uh, at the um, the excavation uh, results also give um, the evidence of the Chinese ceramic um, in this uh, ancient port, uh, but uh, but the, 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 the quantity is uh, is not so abundant. Um, here uh, now at the at the museum in the Hoi An, we could see the uh, the, the evidence of the Guizhou wares of the 9th century and also the Changsha wares uh, from China. And, but the, the the number is very limited. Uh, the third 
the third uh, location is the Tulao Cham Island. Tulao Cham Island is just uh, off the coast of Hoi An, Nepal. And Tulao Cham is an, uh, is an island outside the mouth of the Tuban River in Guangnam province. And it has uh, established it itself at a critical site in Champa archaeology. And both Chinese and Arab traders they reported on the maritime trip that Kula Cham was a vital spot for seafaring sailors because they could gather the fresh water, the firewood, and the, uh, and the food for their lengthy expedition. Mm, uh, for example, uh, this uh, map showing the maritime, uh, maritime uh, route from the southern China and they go at the Kulao Cham, uh, Kulao Cham Island uh, before they set sail to the southern um, uh, post and southern uh, space. Uh, we also have the, uh, the historical record from the Chinese uh, uh, from the from the Chinese uh, historical record uh, showing the uh, um, uh, showing the information about the location of Kulao Cham. And Vietnamese and uh, Japanese archaeologists uh, we, uh, have undertaken many, many uh, surveys and, uh, um, and tests and excavation uh, at the, uh, in the Pulau Cham Island uh, and uh, many important uh, sites like the Bai Lang Sai or Bai Ong Sai in Pulau Cham. And at this uh, excavation, uh, Vietnamese and uh, Japanese archaeologists had uh, um, discovered uh, the, the, the Yuecho, the Changsha uh, ceramics from China. And they also, uh, in, in the same context with the Islamic uh, pottery by the 9th century, and also the, the grasses from the Western Arabia. So, uh, this uh, the archaeological evidence uh, proving. Uh, the the role of the Pulau Cham Island uh, in, during the Cham period. Uh, so the main part of my presentation will uh, 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 will pay attention on the on the shipwreck uh, on the Chotan shipwreck and the Chinese ceramic collection from the Chotan shipwreck in the Guangna province uh, in the southern of uh, in the um, it's, uh, about uh, ninety kilometers uh, south of the Pulau Cham Island. And uh, during the last uh, few years, uh, after the discovery, uh, after the discovery by uh, the late Professor Nishimura and the Nishimura team by the Vietnamese and the Japanese uh, uh, archaeologist uh, team, uh, they have undertaken uh, a, a, a detailed and in-depth research on the on the ship and on the cargo and on the material of the of, of the, the Chotan ship. And uh, for my for my personal uh, research, I uh, paid uh, attention on the Chinese uh, ceramic uh, collection from this uh, shipwreck. So I uh, go back and forth to this site uh, many times during the last few years, and we uh, to, to document the uh, document all the material uh, related to the trading ceramics. Um, from, uh, from this uh, shipwreck, uh, the the ceramic collection was consist of about like four hundred uh, sandbags, of which the ceramics from the Changsha in Yue and the King and King Kings constitute the largest of them. Uh, I will I, I will introduce uh, briefly about the, the the ceramic collection and uh, uh, also uh, divided into the. Uh, are divided into the uh, following the origins of the, the ceramic collection. The first collection is the uh, the first part of this collection is the the, the Chinese ceramic from the Qing and the Xing kings in the northern part of China. It's uh, just in the southern of the in Beijing city, Beijing city, and uh, the. Uh, at this shipwreck, uh, at this shipwreck, and the, and the, in this collection, uh, a, a large number of the very high quality of the pink and the sea wares, the white gray wares, uh, with the very high quality, and, um, and was uh, discovered and was uh, documented in this. And uh, uh, the popular types were including the the dishes, the bowls, and uh, the bow and dishes are among the the most important um, uh, type of the ceramic collection from this. Uh, it's very interesting that the, the thing and sing where is not far, this is quite 
is quite abandoned in, in uh, uh, numerous in this collection in this archipelago. But in other other archaeological sites in Champara during this period, we did not uh, we did not find the traces or we find the evidence of the thing and the scene ceramic uh, in the in the uh, archaeological context uh, of the Champara site. So. Um, I think that uh, this uh, the products were not uh, made for the Champa uh, uh, market, but they, uh, they they were exported to the Southern uh, Kingdom uh, in Davao or in Sri Vijaya. The second collection uh, of the Champa uh, of the Chinese ceramic uh, industry, right, is a uh, is the Changsha is the Changsha uh, Changsha ceramic collection. Uh, Chansa ceramic contain bowls, euros, plates, and pieces, and decorated with the white gray, the brown gray, and the green gray in a variety of shapes. And, uh, the Chansa the Chansa ceramic consists um, uh, composed of the the largest collection of Chinese ceramic uh, during the time period in this surprise. Uh, and you could see uh, the photo was taken by myself in two thousand twelve, and uh, it was the with the uh, um, is, uh, with the, the very early phase of uh, of my study on the ceramic and uh, of this uh, uh, collection, uh, ceramic, ceramic collection as well, and this the photo was taken uh, just uh, this early this year. So after almost ten years, the ceramic the Changsha ceramic collection is still uh, preserved uh, in the private collection of the Mr. Lam Du Sheng in Panghai Province uh, in the. Uh, in, a, in a good condition, and, uh, and the photo was taken uh, like a few years ago uh, when uh, this survey again in this uh, collection. And uh, I just this image just to show that uh, the abundance of the Changsha wares uh, in uh, Changsha wares in the in the in the right. And uh, to compare with the other archaeological sites in Central Vietnam, like in Ho An or in Da Nang or in Pulau Cham, uh, we could see that uh, the Changsha ware was uh, among the most favorite uh, ceramic uh, for the Champa uh, people during the time period. Because uh, we we also found we also found the evidence of the Changsha ware in uh, in other other trading um, sites. Uh, the third collection is the uh, the collection of the Yue, where from the Zhejiang uh, province, and the, uh, for the Yue ware is the, the the bow and the the bow and the pieces is the, the most abundant, and we could uh, we we could also find uh, many evidence of the Yue ware uh, in the other sites like in Boyan and in Pulau Cham as well, and also in the in the in Danang uh, Nam Tosen site in Danang city as well. So the 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 Changsha wear and the Yue wear uh, was uh, uh, the favorite um, ceramics um, products for the Champa market. I think. The next collection is the uh, Chinese ceramic collection from uh, Guangdong province in the southern China. And uh, from uh, as it, as it's a secret, it's uh, a larger, the larger jars uh, with the handle and also the euro from the Guangzhou. Uh, it's a very important uh, evidence. And, uh, with uh, the with the Chinese character, so we know the information about the uh, to, to provide the information about the name of the location and the name of the uh, origins of this Guangdong uh, jar. And in this collection, the inscription on the basis of jar and versions with the two types of insight and the ink inscription are very uh, stimulating. And they were uh, written. They were written on the uh, on the basis of the Guangdong basins, like the like the photo you could see on my screen. Uh, I will not. Uh, I I will not um, discuss about this the meaning of this uh, inscription because uh, it was undertaken by the uh, by the Nishimura project team and Japanese team. Uh, but uh, the one information. Uh, interesting information is that uh, this, like for example, this uh, photo 
uh, and it's uh, translated by uh, by Prof. Toru uh, Aojaba. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this script mentioning about the name of the Embarak. Embarak is a, a, a place in the uh, Syrah or in the Persian Gulf uh, in the Western area. Uh, so it could uh, see the evidence of the connection between the southern China, within China with Champa and from Champa to the uh, Western area by the uh, ninth century. Okay. Uh, so the last part of my presentation, I will introduce briefly about another the Tang period shipwreck uh, of the coast of, uh, of southern Vietnam uh, in the Khon Dao region or uh, in the river mouth of the Mekong River. And I, I did not have a personal experience in uh, doing survey uh, in this area, but uh, my my friend, my colleague, and the collectors from the from the southern Vietnam have provided me with the uh, information uh, of the uh, of the shipwreck. And here are some uh, photos from the from the from the from the from the shipwreck. And it, it, we could see that there's some similarity with the with the tongue uh, tongue cargo that we that's um, has been uh, discovered in the in, in Indonesia and, uh, and preserved in Singapore. Uh, the 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 tongue shipwreck in, in in Singapore. And so it's just evident with the evidence from the archaeological site in central Vietnam and the shipwreck site in central Vietnam and in southern Vietnam. I could I could uh, propose uh, and figure out a tentative um, itinerary of the of the shipwreck of the, of the ship uh, during the Tang uh, period uh, after they set sail from the southern China to the Pulau Cham Island and they they set sail along the coast of Vietnam and they uh, there are two ways from the southern Vietnam one way they could uh, uh, they could sail to the southern Thailand, where we have the evidence of another shipwreck uh, during the Tang period in the in the in the Thailand Gulf. And the other way is uh, they go sail directly to the uh, to the Java Sea, and we also have uh, many evidence of the shipwreck in this uh, in the Java Sea island. And the south and after passing the the, the maritime uh, territory of South Arabia, the the ship. Uh, could set sail to the uh, to India and the uh, uh, and to Siraf in the Western Asia. Uh, so uh, now is my uh, discussion and conclusion from my presentation. Uh, so the Chinese ceramic accounted for the vast majority of the foreign ceramic discovered in Champa between the seventh and the tenth century, and only a small amount of the Islamic pottery has been discovered in in the same context. Uh, especially in the Pulau Cham and the Nam Tosin side. Uh, in the context of the Champa pottery during this period, which were largely ungrade, the advent of the great Chinese ceramic with the exquisite design, superior quality, and the aesthetic was undoubtedly employed by the Champa society elite, uh, elite groups, including the monarchs and the official uh, reverences of the elite and the merchants. And the Chinese ceramic is, uh, was found in a wide variety of the archaeological sites, from the burial site to the residential site in Citadel and also the Po City. And the commercial area and the Po City in particular had the high concentration of the Chinese pottery. And this demonstration that Chinese ceramic appear to have developed into a unique item carried uh, to the Champa post by the Chinese trader and chief of the Trampa commercial community. Uh, and among the Chinese ceramic discovered in Champa, the most frequently seen grouping are the Changsha uh, pottery, the Yuechou pottery, and the Guangdong pottery. This is uh, corroborated further by the discover, discovery of the comparable pottery in the Chotan shipwrecks. And also the white gray ceramic from the Qing and the Xing kings appear to be uncommon at the archaeological site, it is abandoned uh, on the Chotan shipwreck. Uh, the Chinese ceramic uh, discovered uh, spread along the central Vietnam's coast, where the Champa Kingdom previously existed, but is mostly, most densely concentrated in the territory of the Nakra Amaravati or the Quang Nam Danang region, 
which were also the Champa, the primary significant political center throughout the Tang period. Uh, during the 9th and 10th century, uh, the Mission Shangri and the Dongjin Holy Land was the Champa two major religious centers in this uh, in the Amaravati region. And we, 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 uh, we could see that uh, the abundance of the Chinese ceramic found in this area uh, also uh, contributed to the prosperous of the Champa economic uh, uh, and also the religious development in Champa in this uh, region uh, during the Tang period. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, Thank you, Alex, for that uh, fascinating talk about ceramics in the uh, Champa archaeological sites in southern Vietnam, central and southern Vietnam. Um, now we've come to our question and answers panels of the session. Uh, may I invite all our speakers to come online and to show their face? Okay, thank you very much. I hope, I hope we have it. If not, we're in trouble. Um, so uh, I'd like to remind everybody to please uh, put their questions in the Q&A uh, box so that we can get to them. Uh, and we already have some questions uh, uh, already. So let me get started on, uh, because I'm biased, I'm going to go with the rock art questions first. Um, sorry, sorry, not sorry. Um, for uh, two questions from Lalita and from uh, Kong Chiang. Um, from Lalita, she asks, have you done any analysis on the pigments, on the colorants? Uh, and do you know anything about their, their uh, stability or any restoration efforts to preserve them? And then the second question from Kong Cheong is, um, the Karoo variant looks similar to Australasia, and uh, even Aboriginal rock art cave paintings. Is there some connection over there? Okay, um, thank you for the question. So for the first one um, about the colorants, yes, we did um, some uh, portable XRF on the red paintings of Tosamala and Noel did the one in, at Guatamun. Um, they are mainly hematite, which is a type of iron oxide. Um, and at Guatampurong, we have not done any uh, analysis, but there are in situ hematite like just across the panel of the red painting. So it's very likely to be red painting. And the black colors, they are usually charcoal um, for Peninsula Malaysia, um, but we couldn't do any XRF on that. So um, for the second question, um, if it's stable, um, for the red, it, it, it's, it should be stable for the red paintings um, for, since they are, have been there for thousands of years, likely. Um, but for the black drawings, it's not that stable because we can compare to some of the drawings in 1990s and for the documentation in 2020 uh, at Guacalawar, a lot of rock art has already disappeared. So um, the thing that we can do right now is just intensive um, documentation of these rock arts. And a lot of sites in Kinta Valley, they're actually very easily accessible. So anyone, they can just go there and which is why there are a lot of graffitis there. Uh, okay, um, I think, I, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> and then for the crow variants, uh, yes, uh, they do look similar to some of the rock art from Australia or even some from India. Um, but for now in within Peninsula Malaysia, they are only limited to the region north of Raya River in Kinta Valley. We have not seen them in any other sites or any other states. So I would believe that this coral variant is endemic to that location. Um, what they are meaning is, um, is we still don't know and more documentation for um, comparative studies will be required. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for, I actually have a couple of questions for Scott. Um, with one is a very technical question, but what did you mean between um, rammed and beaten? I'm not sure whether you made the distinction. Uh, and then the second, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask you, get you to answer that first. So the, the differences we're seeing between like beaten and rammed earths, um, the beaten earths are kind of like, a, they're not constructed. 
they're more of a progress of people walking over and activities occurring on where rammed earths are produced. They're being constructed, sometimes bringing in different materials and just hammering it down would be one way of saying. All right, so around this deliberate, well, that's uh, uh, beaten is probably gradual. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, my second question, probably a longer one is, um, was there any expectations from your excavation? Uh, I mean, you were essentially testing out whether Bagan was old as it was in the historical record. And um, I was wondering what the local response to your findings were, whether, whether people are saying, oh no, you're, you must be mistaken, our history says. Uh, I don't know, we'll see after this presentation just happened. Uh, <laughs> um, to a degree, I, I think some of it's known. Um, I think it will be accepted. I think the most important thing I think to take away from our paper is that there is a lot of tantalizing lines of evidence that we can follow to de develop a much better understanding of pre -Bagan. Um And like even with the IRA excavations, we are finding pre begon stuff. So it's a matter of more research focused excavations, I think. So it's not a matter of like, okay, yeah, we, we're conclusive here, we're not. We're just saying we need to dedicate some more time to these questions really. And think about the Chronicles a little more critically. I'm, I'm reminded about um, Stephen Arcobaro's work about his uh, redating the, the, you know, the long held 2000 year old stone terraces in the Philippines and he had pushed back about, about them being recent. And so, yeah, I was just thinking that, oh, this might be, might be equally potential to, you know, it's um, potential to be controversy, but, uh, uh, but also a potential to engage local communities. Yes, exactly. And it's, yeah, it's a good time to engage. And like, while excavations are developing, more information is coming to light about what we can talk about, really. Um, so moving to the other royal capital, um, is this a question for Thousand Lat? Um, I have a question about Hamsavati, uh, as you showed it, because you, you had a nice map. Um, how big is it from, from east to west, north to, north to south, and how many people live there now? Uh, the population of Boko now is um, two, uh, 250,000. Yes. Uh, 250,000 within the walled city or just within like the whole Bago region? Uh, may maybe the whole municipal area. Yes. And how, how large is the walled city? How many kilometers is the from, from end to end? Uh, it, because we are using the imperial system. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's about 1.55 meter from east to west. And, one five one five seven my uh, my mile sorry, one point five mile from east to west and one point seven mile from north to south. All right, so you're one point five miles around. All right, thank you. That that, that, that was just uh, my curiosity. Okay, I have also a couple of questions for Alex. Uh, one's from Shran from the last uh, from the last session. Um, she asked whether there's a um, difference in the distribution of ceramics across the different sites of Vietnam. So is the import wares versus locally made wares different at different port sites? And I was thinking about the same thing too. Do you have different ceramics, different distribution of Chinese ceramics in the Dai Viet areas and in the Champa areas? Uh, thank you, Shanxin and uh, uh, Noah for the question. Um, so the geographical um, location of the question is uh, much broader than my presentation because you're asking about Vietnam. So I need to compare between Champa and Dai Viet. Uh, so uh, for the for the for the Dai Viet in the north, the and I I just mentioned about the Tang period um, from the 9th to the 10th century. The 
the number of the Chinese ceramic is in, in uh, we excavated in northern Vietnam, especially in, in the uh, Thang Long Citadel, is uh, much much abandoned than the, the number of the Chinese ceramic we excavated, we found in central Vietnam. I mean, in in ancient Champa during the Tang period. Uh, for example, uh, the especially the the, the Changsha and the Yue, where are also the Phong Tong uh, in the northern Vietnam, they uh, with like a million uh, pieces uh, that we uh, excavated from the uh, Thang Long Citadel itself uh, only, and uh, not not to mention other side in northern Vietnam, and also in the north of Vietnam, we, the Vietnamese uh, potter they also have the tradition of producing the ceramics, so. Uh, they are uh, the, the the Chinese and the Vietnamese uh, make uh, by the uh, from the 10 uh, during the 10 uh, like uh, from the 7th to the 10th century the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the the amount is quite uh, similar uh, I mean that uh, equal in the uh, in the Thang Long Citadel uh, and but in the case of Champa in the case of Champa like uh, I mentioned in my uh, presentation um, during the Tang period the ceramic I mean that the gray ceramic like the Changsha, the Yue, and the Ting, uh, the Ting and the Xing uh, was not uh, popular in Champa. Uh, but they they only uh, uh, they only uh, the appear in the shipwreck uh, in the trading uh, sites, but not much in the in the temple or not much in the occupational sites. Uh, but the Guangdong, the Guangdong uh, Zha is quite uh, popular in the in, in Champa uh, archaeological sites and is uh, distributed in the uh, from the the port uh, port side and uh, from the barrier side as well. Uh, so uh, because uh, my research is uh, for this uh, presentation, I just mentioned about the Tang period. But for the later period, I mean that during the Tong and the Tong and the Yuan and the Ming uh, period. There, there is a change or the shift in the distribution of the Chinese ceramic in Champa site. For example, during the Tong period, uh, the Song period, we found uh, abundance of the Chinese Song uh, ceramic in the temple uh, of the Champa temple and all the various sites, and also in the citadel. So it's uh, uh, with a larger number, and uh, I mean that uh, there are changes in the in the status of the Chinese of the Champa people. So in the different period. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I've run out of questions. Uh, I'd like to just ask if anybody has any more questions to please raise them quickly because we are also coming up to the end of our session time. Um, I don't see any new questions coming up. So with that, I would like to thank our uh, presenters uh, this afternoon. Uh, yeah, this afternoon now in, in, in Bangkok. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentations. Um, we hope to see you soon in person uh, and we'll have the proceedings published at the uh, released at the end of this week. Uh, so you know we will we will launch it digitally at the end of this week. Um, anything. Um, so with that, we will take a fifteen minute break uh, until our next session that starts at one pm uh, Bangkok time. And this in the next session, we will go to Cambodia and Thailand and Myanmar again. Um, so for our current presenters, we will we will shift you into the attendee list pretty soon. And for our upcoming speakers on the next session, we will uh, promote you into the panelist section pretty soon as well. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. Have a good break and we will see you at uh, one. <laughs>